Hi, I'm Bill Patrick. The program you're about to see is part of a vintage series called Car and Track, which was originally produced during the first half of the 1970s. Before we begin the show, though, a brief program note. Using as many as eight cameras to shoot a single event, Car and Track captured some of the great NASCAR competitions of the era, one race at a time. Over the course of some 80 episodes through six seasons, series producer and host Bud Lindemann lovingly documented a unique era in American motor racing. While the race action contained in the series remains timeless, the program itself has not dated quite so gracefully. Although the years have not been overly kind to Bud's decidedly low-key introductions and interviews, we believe them to be an integral part of this one-of-a-kind series. So please, stay with us now as Speed Vision presents a rare slice of 1970s Americana, Car and Track. Action packages come in a variety of sizes. We feel that today's show could be considered a jumbo. Well, first off, we're going down to Bristol, Tennessee to watch the good old boys of NASCAR run the Southeastern 500. They do this annually, but this year, it's the fastest ever. Our road test car of the week is an Opal out of the 1900 series, an economy car that just might offer you a little bit more. And then finally, a run over to Great Lakes Dragaway in Wisconsin and a meeting of the Jets, Funny Cars, and Nitro Fuelers. Hey, this one's a Sizzler. We'll be ready to go in one minute. Most of the NASCAR races seen on television are those run on the big mile and two and a half mile super speedways. But when following the circuit, you find that these rebels run all kinds of races on all kinds of tracks. We thought you'd like to see them go on a half mile track. Well, we chose Bristol because it's perhaps the fastest high banked oval in the country. For the spectators, well, there's a thrill on every lap. For the drivers, 500 times around this one, is the most grueling, exhaustive test on the circuit. Another sellout crowd of 34,700 race fans greeted us in the little mountain town of Bristol, Tennessee. It was the Southeastern 500, and all the grand national stars of NASCAR were here to run for a chunk of the $37,875 purse. The high banks make Bristol perhaps the fastest half-mile track in the country. The drivers consider 500 laps on this course to be the most strenuous on the circuit. Richard Petty will experiment with power steering on his Plymouth for the first time. Most of the other drivers have gone to lighter weight helmets connected to underarm lanyards to ease neck fatigue. Bobby Allison pushed his Chevrolet around these high banks at a qualifying speed of 106.874 miles per hour to gain fast time and the pole position. Number 43 Plymouth of Richard Petty starts second alongside Allison. Then it's Bobby Isaac in a Dodge and Betty Parsons driving a 70 Mercury. Leroy Yarborough and Cuckoo Marlin fill out the third row. All cars are holding position well now as they pour out of the fourth turn and down for the green flag. There it is, and they're off. Out of the gate, the battle starts early as Allison and Petty are locked up for the lead. At the end of the first lap, Allison fights off the Petty Plymouth and grabs the number one spot. That's the first casualty of the race. In the third lap, George Altidy loses his dodge in the fourth turn, spins onto the apron and heads for pit road. There's no yellow flag and the race continues. Now, Bobby Isaac closes the gap on Allison with Petty hanging back in the third spot. It's Chevy Dodge Plymouth. Uh-oh, Dave Boggs just blew his Dodge in the third turn, but he hangs on and wheels it into the pit. On the same lap, here's another blown engine. 
This time, it's the number 85 Chevrolet driven by Ronnie Daniel. With two engines blown and oil on the racetrack, the first yellow flag of the day is out, and drivers take this opportunity to pit. laps under the yellow, the field is back on the track and ready for the restart. Through the third turn, Cuckoo Marlin leads with Allison pushing him hard. Allison works him over high and low through every turn. Leroy has the third spot with Benny Parsons running fourth. Finally, out of the back chute onto turn three, Allison gets the nose of his Chevy underneath Marlin and powers through to regain his lead. Bobby Allison's Coca-Cola Chevrolet starting to stretch the pack. Isaac and Marlin are dueling over second. Leroy Yarborough is fourth and Benny Parsons fifth. In turn two, Bobby Isaac slides his Dodge Charger beneath Marlin to pass and take a firm hold on the number two position. Once past Marlin and out of heavy traffic, Bobby Isaac turns it on in a bid to catch Allison. But he'll really have to move. That Chevy has a quarter of a lap lead and Petty is coming on. Down the back chute, Richard catches Cuckoo Marlin, and there's a new battle for third place. That Plymouth and Chevy look like they're glued together. On the 130th lap, Dave Marcus pits his Dodge with an overheating Hemi. They check it out and find broken radiator hoses and park the car behind the wall. Here's the leader, Bobby Allison, in for fuel and right side rubber. Junior Johnson and the crew get him back on the track in 23 seconds. But during this stop, Bobby Isaac takes over the lead. Isaac's lead is short-lived because he, too, has to make the rubber and fuel stop. Tire wear starts to take its toll on this fast half-mile track as one after another the cars are forced to pit. Here's Cuckoo Marlin. Petty crew does a quick job on Richard's STP Plymouth.
With the leader's service and back on the track, it's Allison in front, Bobby Isaac second, Richard Petty third, and Yarborough fourth. There's another spinner. Richard Childress, driving a Chevy, lost it in the third turn, spun all the way around, and decides to pit for new tires. Meanwhile, Bobby Allison continues his race for the checkered flag. His Monte Carlo is wound tight and handling perfect. With only a few laps left, Petty wraps a slower car, crushing his fender in against the left front tire. It begins to smoke. He gets the black flag, and Richard will be forced to pit. Maurice, Petty, and the crew work frantically to bend the twisted steel out of the wheel well so they can replace the tire. is shredded. In the run for the wire, it's Allison first, Bobby Isaac second, Petty third, Yarborough fourth. There's the white flag, one more lap, and Bobby Allison celebrates tonight. Here he is off the high bank fourth turn, onto the front straightaway for the checkered flag, and Bobby Allison puts a Chevrolet into the Bristol record book. Winner of the Southeastern 500. Herb Nabb and the Junior Johnson crew are already in victory lane, waiting for the arrival of their car and their driver. It was a beautiful Sunday drive for Bobby Allison. He picked up a check for $7,000, the trophy, and was met by a bevy of beauty. But even more important, he started a Chevrolet down the comeback trail. But then that grin kind of tells the whole story. You know, the trend toward the economy car has been and still continues to grow. And for a multitude of reasons. For many families, it's a second car. For others, high prices dictate a move to the mini category. And for some, they're a fad. Well, in any case, certain things have to be sacrificed for economy. And our car and track test division has been working with many of them and selecting those that we consider a better buy. Now, not necessarily the cheapest, but those that, well, they give you the most for the dollar spent. For that reason, you might want to consider the Opel 1900. Since we obviously haven't the time to test all of the economy cars, it's necessary to get quite selective in those we present on the show. The Opel 1900 is a German-built car imported to the United States by Buick Motor Division. After working with many of the small cars, we felt that this Model 57 Opel 1900 was one of the better buys in the many fields, particularly in the performance department, where it first caught our attention with its sweeping wins on the SCCA circuit. Powered by this four-cylinder inline overhead cam engine with a 1.9 liter or 115.8 cubic inch displacement delivering 78 horsepower. The Opel came off the line in good shape. 30 miles an hour took three seconds flat. With all four holes humping and 78 horses working, we clocked 0 to 50 in 7.5 seconds. We made several top-end runs at over 100 miles an hour. This was our best 0 to 60 time at 16.6 seconds. The little Deutschmobile really came on in the pylon run. It snaked through the cones like it was built to do this all day long. They put an excellent suspension system under the 1900 that enabled our driver to run the shortened course at 40 miles an hour with very little front corner dive and even less body lean. The good rebound and recovery shows up well in this head-on slow motion run. Thank you. 
On the braking course, we felt that the Opal should have done a little better. Our 30 mile an hour stop took 43 feet. The 1900 series features discs up front with drums in the rear. From 50 miles an hour, we measured out 86 feet to the stop point with quite a bit of correction necessary to keep it straight. With the brakes hot, this 70 mile an hour panic stop ate up 209 feet. Nosedive was minimal, but the pedal faded noticeably, almost to the floor. On the track during high speed cornering, we learned why the Opal was doing so well on the racing circuit. There was little or no front end washout. It stayed glued all the way through the turn. The overall weight was 2,160 pounds, 1,149 of which is in the front and 1,019 in the rear, giving the car excellent balance. The 1900 series boasts independent suspension all the way around, and under the front they employ ball joints with short and long control arms, combination strut and rod stabilizers, coil springs and concentric shock absorbers. If the thought of a mini car grabs you, remember to obtain economy, several sacrifices are necessary, usually in deluxe appointments, comfort, and performance. However, we feel that in this Opal 1900, these sacrifices are not as great. For us, this trip to Great Lakes Dragaway was a return to the Jets. You know, it's been over two years since we've covered a Jet meet. When Bob Metzler called and told us he had the Jets, funny cars, nitro fuelers, and wheel standers, and all on the same bill, <laughs> we decided to pack up and go. You know, we found some of the biggest names and the hottest cars in the business. With the jet dragsters, funny cars, wheel standers, and nitro fuelers, Great Lakes Dragaway was hosting the biggest speed show in the Midwest, with a crowd to match. But this meet was a little different. The jets were taking on the funny cars and the fuelers. The first pairing featured Paula Murphy's Hemi Duster against the Odyssey rear-engine jet. Paula comes from behind to sizzle out a 7.91 win over the Odyssey, driven by Larry Keisha. The crowd was really up when the Chi-Town Hustler came to the line to go against the Dragon Breath jet car. Pat Minnick, a former Chicago policeman, drives the famous Chi-Town Dodge Challenger. The Hustler screams through the traps with a winning ET of 7.10 and over 212 miles an hour. This time, Jim Nicole in a nitro fueler draws the jet car Exodus. The Exodus wins it with an ET of 7.46, 222 miles an hour. Dave Corey fires up the Malco Monster jet and comes up to the line against Fred Goski's Barracuda Funny Car. Goski's Hemi Cuda scorches the jet and barks through the traps with a winning ET of 7.05. Here's the daddy of jet cars, Arfon, driving the Super Cyclops, staging with Tommy Ivo's fuel dragster. Arfon's explodes down the chute to sizzle out a new record time, 5.96, 266.27 miles an hour. In this run, Arnie the Farmer Beswick goes up against Fred Sibley in the US-1 jet. He has that turban wound and screaming, but Arnie is an old pro and comes up with a beautiful hole shot to take the win with an ET of 7.23, 209 miles an hour. This run with the wheel standards features the little red wagon on the outside, the Chevy Rebellion on the inside in lane one. Dick Hutchin wins it by holding the Chevy Rebellion on the rear wheels all the way and punches through the traps at 106 miles an hour. During the short intermission before the final rounds, mechanics check their cars thoroughly, particularly the jet dragsters. These cars are extremely sophisticated and require a lot of work. The jet engines, in most cases, were designed for planes. Their output, between 15 and 17,000 horsepower, with over 12,000 pounds of thrust. Not having direct drive to the wheel, they can't match the fuelers or funny cars coming off the line. However, their speed down the last half of the strip is blinding.
For the last round, Chris Caramancina stages his fuel drag through with Art Arfon's Super Cyclops jet car, and the crowd is up. Arfon repeats his winning ways by putting the Golden Greek on the trailer with a winning ET of 6.08. Goski walks off with the honors as his Barracuda Duster takes the Malco Monster with a 702 to the Jets 760. In this pair off, Don Cook's Nitro Fueler sizzles out a winning ET of 6.70 over the Green Monster's 7.29. Tommy Ivo drives the fueler in lane one, screams through the trap ahead of Jerry Studnicka in the Dragon Breath jet car. Ivo's ET, 6.71, 222 miles an hour. In the final go with the wheel standards, Frank Monaghan stays up on the rear wheels all the way to win over Bill Maverick's Little Red Wagon. Now it's the Shy town Hustler in lane one, the Exodus in lane two. Pat Minnick and the Hustler takes it with a 705, 212 miles an hour. Arnie Beswick and his fabulous Firebird make it a clean sweep for the day as he dusts off Doug Rose in the Green Mamba Jet with an ET of 7.06. The last run of the day pitted Dick LaHaye's Nitro Fueler against Fred Sibley in the US-1 jet. LaHaye streaks by the jet to post a winning ET of 7.05 at 196 miles an hour. The jet speed was clocked at 227 miles an hour, but a higher ET lost the duel. All in all, it wasn't the best day the jet drivers have ever had. But when they towed away, they left with a track record. And they left a speed-stunned crowd eager for their return. Well, that's all the time we have for right now. But you know, this is a weekly affair. And we'll have more of the same next week at this same time. Try to join us, won't you? Until then, this is Bud Lindemann, reminding you to drive it careful, like a pro. And bye-bye. <laughs>